we're going to talk about presumptuous uh, judgment from uh, from James Epistle, and um, I I would like to suggest that this you know maybe one of the biggest issues in ecclesial life overcome and one of the more difficult to um, deal with. You know, a lot of presumptuous judgment goes into potential ecclesial division. And it works against ecclesial harmony. And presumptuous judgment works against brotherly love. And so James finds it necessary here to talk to his fellow Jewish brethren about their love for the hierarchy of their society. And he speaks out against it because there is no room for that in the Ecclesia. And under the law, there was not supposed to be any room for it either, but over time, it developed and that is our human nature. And and so James sees it necessary here to take a good portion of James chapter two, the chapter on faith to talk about how partiality works against faith. And he, he says there are two things in James chapter two. He says, first of all, in these verses that we've read, of which our focus is going to be on this afternoon, that you cannot have faith, true faith, with respective persons. You cannot have true faith with respect of persons. The two are mutually exclusive. You can't have faith in God who has chosen us all to be here and then have respect of persons and say that you have true faith. And then in the second part of this chapter, and it's somewhat related to the first part of the chapter, he says, you cannot have faith without works, especially when you only perform works on or um, to certain groups of people. If we perform our works only with people whom we deem to be in our own judgment, people that are welcome into our circle. And we only perform good works on those type of people, but we deceive ourselves, we fool ourselves, and our works really mean nothing. And so you cannot have faith with respect of persons, and you cannot have faith without works, especially when those works are only done on certain groups of people whom we deem to be worthy of receiving the charity which we're willing to give. And so in James chapter 2, verses 1 to 13, there's really five principles of partiality that he outlines here that we're going to consider this afternoon. The first one is that partiality is inconsistent with God's character. God does not uh, act based on partiality. Um, I suppose God has a bit of an advantage in in that he he knows our, our thoughts. He knows our innermost being. He knows our motivations. And so it's a lot easier for him, perhaps, not to be partial in in or exclude. Nevertheless, it is not even close to being a part of God's character. That's not even something that God would entertain, and he does not stand for it within his people. The second principle is that if we are being partial, really our motives are corrupt. There is something wrong in our thinking. The third point there is that partiality contradicts God's calling. God has caused called us all 
and he has chosen us all to be included. And yet if we're being partial, we're in effect kind of questioning God's calling and saying, well, I only really want to be associated with this group of people. And so partiality then contradicts God's calling. Partiality, point number four, is it violates scripture. It's not a scriptural thing. And we're going to look at some of the allusions back to Leviticus chapter 19. And then finally, it lacks point number five, the compassion of Christ. So let's begin with point number one. Partiality. Partiality is inconsistent with God's character. So he says in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. So what does he mean with, re with respect of persons? Well, the Greek would say partiality or favoritism, or the literal translation translates that as persons in admiration. So do not have faith with persons in admiration. Judge has respect to the outward circumstances of men and not to their intrinsic merits, and so prefers as the more worthy one who is rich, high-born, or powerful to an And so with that as a definition, you know, partiality, respect of persons, having persons in admiration, and if we understand that and think about how God looks at us, there is none of us that really measure up. There's none of us that, you know, God would, <clears throat> if he looked only on the outward appearance, would say, perhaps that's somebody that I want to be uh, part of my people. The outward circumstances and what we um, look like make no difference to our Heavenly Father whatsoever. Job chapter 34 and verse 19. So here's one of our allusions uh, back to the book of Job. Job 34 and verse 19, talking about the, um, uh, the knowledge of God and how the, the um, well, the topic at the top of my Bible is the omnipotence of God. And it says there in verse 19, how much less to him that accepteth not the persons of princes, nor regardeth the rich more than the poor. For they are all the work of his hands. And so the key phrase there is at the end of verse 19, right? All of these, whether they're rich or whether they're poor, whether they're princes, whether they're, they're subjects, whether they're, doesn't matter what status they have in society, makes absolutely no difference what this passage says that regardless of of where they are and 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 what they do in the community it says there at the end of the verse that they are all the work of his hands they're all the work of god's hands he's created us all deuteronomy chapter 10 and verses 17 to 19. deuteronomy 10 verse 17 reads for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. He doth execute judgment of the fatherless and widow. He loves the stranger in giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. So there's the thinking of God in Deuteronomy chapter 10. Right. He he is a God of gods, a Lord of lords, a great and a mighty and terrible God. That does not. Regard. Persons. Persons mean nothing. He, In fact, you know, it says that he loves the stranger and he provides for the stranger just like he does his own people. And so because God loves the stranger, he says in verse 19, therefore, you should love the stranger also. Because you know what? You were once strangers in Egypt as well. And in Romans chapter 2 and verse 11, it says, 
There is no respect of persons with God. So God has no respect for the outward appearance of the social status of who an individual is from an outward perspective. That means nothing to God, but it means everything to our human thought process, doesn't it? We base a lot of our um, opinions or perceptions or paradigms of people based on what we see, what we observe. And this is how the human thought process works on this slide. We make observations and based on outward appearance, social status, the behaviors, how people talk, what they talk about. We make observations. And based on those observations, we begin, begin to make assumptions. And over time, we start to categorize different groups of people. And as we make observations about people, we put them into one category or another. And we develop these paradigms, these perceptions of who people are and what they're not. And then based on the paradigm that we have, have drawn up and the categories that we have of the different people that we've made these outward observations about, we choose then to either exclude or include them. And God has chosen us all. So who are we then? If God has chosen us all, who are we then to exclude some whom God has called to be in our ecclesia? What business do we have of questioning God? Because that's really what we're doing when we make these, these judgments and, and have this partial sort of attitude about who's in and who's not. God has chosen all of us to be here. And we may not exclude somebody. You know, we may not write them off, but we might avoid them. We might shun them. We might treat them differently. And maybe we fail to treat them as a true brother or sister. So we may not exclude them totally. Maybe it's a little bit more subtle than that. But nevertheless, we create a point of difference. And that human thought process, we do it without even thinking about it. It just, it just happens. It's who we are. We make those observations. We draw those paradigms. That just happens. It's part of, of the way we think. It's part of the way our brains were wired. But we have to teach ourselves not to listen to that part of our brain. Because we make those observations doesn't mean that we have to act on them. And they become wrong, especially when we start acting on the observations that we have made. And so partiality then reveals corrupt motives, doesn't it? And here's one of our allusions back to Leviticus. Turn back to Leviticus chapter 19, if you will. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 15, it says, Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. But in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. And so there's the principle taken from Leviticus chapter 19 that James deems it necessary to elaborate on in his epistle so that his fellow Jewish brethren will know how to properly behave themselves in the ecclesia. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 17. Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 17 uses an interesting phrase to describe what it means to be partial or to have respect of persons. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 17 says, Ye shall not respect persons in judgment. Now, if you look at your margin, what does your margin say? Ye shall not acknowledge faces in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God. So ye shall not 
acknowledge faces in judgment. What a person looks like, what they stand for, what they um, what place or position they have in society, whether they're rich or whether they're poor, doesn't make any difference. When you're performing judgment, you don't consider those things. You don't hold their faces in admiration. You don't acknowledge their face. First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 21 talks about the same sort of concept, but in the context of the ecclesia. First Timothy chapter 5, reading, I've uh, lost Timothy in my Bible. Where's Timothy? And says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, or if you have your margin, without prejudice. And so in all of the comings and goings of the Ecclesia, we're not to prefer one before another, that we might do nothing, it says there, by partiality. And so God has called us all, and we are therefore not to prefer one before another. Jude verse 16 says that we should not hold men's persons in admiration. All of those things are spoken out against in the word of God. And so when we come back to James chapter 2, he gives us an example, doesn't he? He says, look at what about the gold ringed man? For if there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come also a poor man in vile raiment. So he, he, he says, here's an example. You have this gold ring man. What paradigm, if I if I describe to you a gold ring man, what what you know, that, that uh, comes in, what does it say, in goodly apparel. What does that conjure up in your mind? You think, well, maybe he's rich, maybe he's educated, you know, maybe he has some high social authority or, or he has power and influence in the community. That's immediately what you conjured up in your mind. And then if there's a poor man that comes in, it says they're in vile raiment. What does that conjure up in your mind? You think, well, maybe uneducated, debt-ridden, he comes with baggage and he's, he's just hanging out because he's looking for a free handout. And even before we talk to these individuals, even before we find out what they're all about, we've already made that mental assessment of who they are. We've already categorized them according to our own mental paradigm and we've boxed them and put them in this certain box. That never happens in the Ecclesia, does it? There's all kinds of potential criteria for social division in the Ecclesia. Wealth, you know, what Ecclesia you attend, you know, your family background, your occupation, race, ethnicity, your physical ability or disability, you know, your belief, and I'm not talking about doctrinal issues there, your age, you know, how active you are in the Ecclesia, whether that be speaking, playing the organ, teaching Sunday school, whatever, that can be a, a cause for division, marital status, children, where you live, lifestyle, dress, education, what Bible school you attend or which you don't, kids camp, youth conference, CYC, you know, whether you're always late, whether you're always early, where you sit in the Ecclesial Hall. You know, and some of these things we might laugh at, but some... Some of these things become big issues. And so he says, when we come back to James chapter 2, he says, if ye have respect to him in gay clothing, the word respect to there means to gaze at. If you can't take your eyes off him because, ooh, uh, you know, I want to associate with that man with the, the gold rings and, the, and the, maybe some of his, his persona will rub off on me or, or maybe I'll up you know, all appear to, to rise up in my social standing because now I'm in his, you know, social clique. He says, if you have respect, if you gaze at him that is in radiant or magnificent clothing, as that word gay means there in verse three, you know, if you have respect to him, then you're wrong. You have to stop and you've got to slap yourself upside the head and say, you know, what, what am I thinking? You know, why in the Ecclesia 
should there be anything special about him who dresses one way or another? But if you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in the Ecclesia at Corinth, this was a real issue. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we begin to read at verse 7. It says, do ye look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trust to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given me for edification, and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. For his letters say they are mighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such an one think this, that such as we are in word, by letters, when we were absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. And here's the key verse, verse 12, it says, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves. Do we do this? Absolutely we do. We look for people that think, that act, that dress, that behave, that talk, that walk, the same as we do. And when we do that, we show partiality. And the sad thing is that sometimes ecclesias are formed around those things. And it's not conducive to growth. It reinforces the narrowness of our thinking, doesn't it? Because God has chosen us all. And so if we say to the poor, stand there or sit under my footstool, we, we, we show a holier-than-thou type of attitude, don't we? We're, we're not much different than the children of Israel that are described in Isaiah chapter 65. In Isaiah chapter 65, uh, it says there at verse 5, and he, he's reprimanding the children of Israel, and he reprimands them in, in uh, verse 5 when he says, you know, you know, you say to yourselves, stand by thyself, do not come near, come near to me, for I am holier than thou. This, he says, is a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. And so when we say to the poor, we, we you know, stand over here or sit under my footstool, we're really elevating ourselves and giving ourselves a higher spiritual plane and saying, you know, I'm really up here. You need to be down there. That's really where you fit in a little bit better. Luke chapter 18. Let's go to Luke chapter 18. And we got to be careful that we don't become pharisaical. We got to be careful that we don't take on in our ecclesias a love for the outward appearance. It says in Luke chapter 18, on certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous, and so they despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican, and the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men or extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Look at me. And the publican, standing afar off, would not even lift so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. So which one are we? You know, the master didn't make any distinctions. We're not going to look at Matthew chapter 9 and verse 11. But in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 11, the master was questioned by the Pharisees. And he was questioned by saying, what, what is it that your master is doing by going and eating with publicans and sinners? The master didn't make any distinction. In fact, 
he probably made the distinction the other way, preferring those who were poor and preferring the publicans and sinners who had the right attitude of mind. If anything, he was prejudiced against the others. Christ did not draw those lines. And so when we come back to James chapter 2 in verse 4, what does he say there? He says, if you conduct yourselves along these lines in the ecclesia, are ye not then partial? Are ye not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? The Phillips translation reads as follows. It says, doesn't that prove that you are making class distinctions in your mind? and setting yourselves up to assess a man's quality, that's a very bad thing. So what does this word partial mean? It means to separate out a person or a thing from the rest, to discriminate, if you will. The same Greek words used in Acts 15 and 1 Corinthians 4, and it's translated there to, to make a difference or to uh, make something to differ from another. And so when we conduct ourselves in the ecclesia, we set up these points of difference. We have this partiality. We are creating separation. We're separating somebody or a group of people off from the rest. And there should be no schism. There should be no division in the ecclesia, whether that's um, a division in our mind or otherwise, there should be no division within the ecclesia. And so the third point is that partiality then contradicts God's calling. If you look at verse 5, it says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? Rotherham renders that as in the future tense. Rather than rich in faith, it says to be rich in faith. So who is he chosen? Who is he working with? Who is he developing to be rich in faith? The poor of this world has nothing to do with outward appearance. And so if God has chosen the poor, he says in verse 6, why have you despised the poor? Why have you dishonored them? Why have you insulted them? Why have you, as the same Greek word is translated in Luke chapter 20, why have you entreated them shamefully if they're the ones that God has chosen to be rich in faith? If they're the ones that God is working with to be rich in faith, why then have you despised them, James says? And so he says in verse six, he says, you know, by the way, you know, you, you, you've given this preferential treatment to those who are rich. He says, you know, it's the rich men that are oppressing you. He says in verse six, it's kind of ironic, isn't it? Isn't it that when they come into your ecclesia, you give them the uppermost seat you welcome them with open arms, and yet they're the ones, he says in verse 6, that oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats. You know, oppression is not just come from without. Sometimes it comes from within. And if you look at the Jewish people, sometimes they were the hardest on themselves you know, the earliest early persecution of the Jewish converts came from the upper classes and the elders of their own race. The nobles and rulers back in Nehemiah, they're the ones that exacted usury of their brethren and took their brethren and their sons and daughters into slavery. You know, the princes of the nation beat uh, the people to pieces in Isaiah chapter th uh, 3. And they were sold, they sold the righteous for silver and a poor for a pair of shoes in Amos chapter 2. And so all this oppression came from within. It came from their own brethren. And James is saying it's kind of ironic, isn't it? That's what happens when you show partiality based on external appearance. 
Point number four is that partiality contradicts God's calling. It says that in verse eight, if ye fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. And so he's quoting from Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18 there. Then he says in verse 9, but if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. So he's quoting from, we've already looked at it, Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 15. And then in verse 10, he says, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. He's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 26. So the law is all or nothing. And so when you combine all those points together in those three verses, what he's really saying is you can't love your neighbor and have respect of persons. You can't love your neighbor and show partiality. The two concepts are mutually exclusive. In order to keep the law, you've got to keep both. You've got to love your neighbor and you've got to not have partiality or show respect of persons. By definition, if you show respect of persons, you're really not loving your neighbor. And so then the last point is that when you show partiality, really you lack the compassion of Christ. And so he says in verse 12, he says, so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath no, has showed no mercy, and mercy, he says, rejoiceth against judgment. So he's introduced here the law of liberty, and that applies to our evaluation of others. How do we apply our evaluation of others? It doesn't mean that we can be willy-nilly with this law of liberty. That's not what he's saying. He's, he's not saying that we can use that law of liberty to show maliciousness and that sort of thing against our, our fellow brethren and sisters. That's not what he means. But he says we need to act and we need to, or we, sorry, we need to speak and we need to act, so speak and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. And if we're not, if we're not acting in that accord, that is, if we're not showing partiality, then we're going to have judgment without mercy. Because he says there in verse 13, he that has showed no, uh, if you show no mercy, then you're going to be judged without mercy. Because mercy rejoices, he says, against judgment. What that really means is, and if you go to Vincent's word studies and H.P. Mansfield's notes on James, he says what really needs to happen is that mercy needs to drown out by noise the judgment that we cast on others when we show partiality. We need to have mercy. They, the, the judgment partiality needs to be drowned out by the loudness of the mercy that is speaking out to us from the word of God. That's what he's saying. Turn, if you will, to 1 Samuel chapter 26. 1 Samuel chapter 26, and here's a great example where David could have taken what we would consider to be just retribution, and he chooses not to, right? It's in the matter of Saul. In 1 Samuel chapter 26 and verse 24, when he spares Saul's life, it says, And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set by in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Right? There's where mercy rejoices against judgment. In verse 24, hopefully the mercy that he's shown to Saul will be reciprocated in the eyes of the Lord by the mercy that the Lord shows to him. That's the principle. That's the principle of the law of liberty. So five points there, right, in, in James chapter 2. Five points about partiality. Partiality in James chapter 2 is inconsistent with God's character. It reveals corrupt motives. It contradicts God's calling. It violates scripture, and it lacks the compassion of Christ. That, those are all the things that he outlines in James chapter 2. And then he kind of summarizes the issue. Turn over to James chapter 4. James 
James chapter four, here's kind of the summary. If you pull all that together, look at what he says here in James chapter four, verse 11. He says, speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. And there is only one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? And so do not speak evil one of another brethren. Two, two passages that we'd like to look at in that regard. Psalm 140 and verse 11. We've already looked at that 2 Corinthians 10 passage, and that's really the root of the problem. First, 2 Corinthians 10 talks about people who measure themselves by themselves, if you recall. So let's go back to Psalm 140 and verse 11. When we measure ourselves by ourselves and we hold our paradigms up as the standard that people meet to be included, right, then we start to speak out against them. We become a judge. Look at what it says in Psalm 140 and verse 11. It says, let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overthrow him. Well, what is an evil speaker? If you look at the slide there, there's the different translations. A talkative man, a slanderer, a man of evil tongue, an idle, idle tongue, a dealer in scandal. You know, when we start to make these judgments based on external appearances and we start to develop these social divisions, if you will, in the ecclesia, and then we start to talk about them, then we are an evil speaker, we're a slanderer, we have an evil tongue, an idle tongue, we start dealing in scandal, and we know where that leads. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 31. Ephesians 4 verse 31 says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and there's our word, evil speaking, the pulpit commentary says the more deliberate habit of running down another's character. Who are we to be doing that to somebody that God has chosen to include? And when we do that, we speak evil of the law. And so thou art not a doer of the law, but you become a judge. We all know where judgment leads. We'd like to conclude in Matthew chapter 7. Go to Matthew chapter 7, if you will. And a very famous passage. We all know it very well. It has to do with the moat and the beam. But it talks about judging one another. Judge not, he says in Matthew 7, verse 1, that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Why do you behold the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? And so the danger of being partial is that it's a very fine line between partiality and judgment. And so when we come to Matthew chapter 7, he says, you need to be very careful when you start to judge another brother. Because chances are, if you're, you're imparting judgment upon another brother or sister, chances are you've got the same problem yourself, is what he's saying in Matthew chapter 7. But you just can't see it. And so when we come to Matthew chapter 7, he says, judge not that ye be not judged. And when we judge one another, this is what, in fact, we are doing. Turn to Romans chapter 14. Keep your finger in Matthew 7. But in Romans chapter 14 and verse 10, he says, why do, you, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you set at naught your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That expression to set at naught means to make utterly nothing, to despise. And the Phillips translation says there, why do you make him look so small? When we judge one another, that's really what we're doing. Is he's saying there in Romans chapter 14, that we're really trying to make ourselves look bigger and make our brother look smaller. Why do you make your brother look so small? He says in Romans 14, verse 10. 
So there's really two concepts here in chapter 7 of Matthew in verse 2. The, the concepts are with what judgment ye judge and what measure ye meet. So those are two different things. The judgment is an internal thing. We make that in our, in our mind, right? And we've said earlier that it's a natural thing to do. We make judgments all the time and we categorize and compartmentalize all the time. That's part of the way we think. That's part of the way our brain is wired. When it becomes wrong is when you start to act on those judgments. And so we have to consciously work by inserting the word of God into our mind and disciplining ourselves not to act on those judgments and push those judgments away and think differently about the people that are within our ecclesia. Because when we start to act on those judgments, he says, that's where he gets to in verse two, with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. That's when the judgment goes from an internal thing to an external. That's when we start to treat people different. And so in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 3, he says there, And why do you behold the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but you consider not the beam that is in thine own eye? The word mote is just a splinter a twi or, or a twig. The beam in the original, in the Greek, is a large structural supporting beam. You know, we might think in our common vernacular of a toothpick versus an eye beam. Right. And you can see the toothpick in your brother's eye, but you can't see the eye beam that's sticking in your own. Why? Because we're blinded by our own self-righteousness. And that's the root of the problem, isn't it? With being partial and being judgmental on one another. We can't see the beam. So how do we get rid of the beam? In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 5, thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. This is the key. We need to make our own sins appear greater to us than the same sin in others. We do that by three things. By self-examination, by opening up ourselves in prayer to God, helping him to see the beam that is in our eye. Cleanse thou me from secret faults. See if there is any wicked way in me. And opening ourselves up to others like David in 2 Samuel 12. So what's the conclusion of the matter? There's no room for partiality in the ecclesia. And let's conclude in the word in the words of James in James chapter five, James chapter five. Note the progression here about the nearness of the coming of the Lord. In verse seven, he talks about the coming of the Lord. In verse eight, he says the coming of the Lord draw, draweth nigh. And in verse nine, he says the judge standeth before the door. The ESV translation for verse 9 is this. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. The message of James is clear. There is no room in ecclesial life for partiality leading to judgment division or separation and so brethren and sisters let us not be grumblers in the ecclesia mumbling and grumbling against one another because if we do james says we will be judged based on the mercy or lack thereof that we show to others